lives that when they hear noises in their lives, they press the panic button. There are high levels of instability in their lives because they are fearful. They don't really trust people because they are fearful of being betrayed. That is a life that is filled with fear. A life that is filled with profanity, guess what comes out when they speak? Profane language, ungodly talk. You go into certain environments and you hear the way people speak and you get to question what was going on last night? What has been filling their hearts? Now this is the question that I want you to answer this morning. What am I filled up with? The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, whatever you've been meditating on, whatever you've been feeding yourself with, guess what? That will come out. You see, we can hide certain things for a period of time, but before we know it, whatever we've been feeding ourselves with will come out. You all know the story of garbage in, garbage out. Now, for a, for a start, as we look at this faith-filled life, I want us to define faith. So that we are on the same page as we go on on this journey, on this series. We cannot talk about the definition of faith without going to Hebrews 11 verse 1. I believe those who have been in the church for long enough already are saying, man, I've heard that verse for a long time. But you've heard that verse for a long time, but can you see the fruit of that verse. So don't shut out. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you today. Hebrews 11 verse 1. The Bible says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to just stop there for a moment. Because when you read this scripture, it highlights to us what faith is all about. Firstly, it highlights to us that faith operates in the now. Hallelujah. Faith is a now issue. You don't want to build faith for yesterday. You don't want to build faith just for tomorrow. Because if your faith cannot sustain you today, you might not get to tomorrow. So that's why the Hebrew writer says, now faith is... So for a start, faith is a now issue. You need faith to work through your issues right now. You need faith to deal with your anxieties right now. You need faith to deal with your failures right now. Not failures that will come tomorrow. Not past failures. Are we together this morning? So is your faith good enough to sustain you where you are right now? Secondly, Faith is the material that makes up what you want to see happening in your life. You might not see certain things right now, but the moment you engage this thing called faith, it gives you the material. It says it is the substance of things hoped for. It is the material of the stuff that we want to see happening in our lives. You see, your, reali your re reality might be detached from what the word says, but when you engage faith, faith enables you literally to touch what you're hoping to get. Right. Hallelujah. That is the second thing that we get about faith. Thirdly, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. So when you have faith... You have the evidence of stuff that you don't have. Now, let's talk about the law issues in the courts. We all know that when there is an issue that is about to be judged, they call on witnesses, and a witness goes on that witness stand, and guess what the witness is trying to do? He is bringing evidence to the judges concerning what happened. The judges were not at the crime scene, but this witness was at the crime scene. Now, the possibility of prosecution really relies heavily on how credible the evidence is. The stronger the evidence, the higher the chances of prosecution. Now, this morning I want to ask you a question. How strong is your evidence concerning what you want God to do for you? Because you see, the witness standing there wants to paint a clear picture to the judge concerning what happened. And it is that picture that will convince the judge whether somebody is guilty or not. 
Now, if your faith has not brought you to a place where things that you haven't seen become so real in your spirit, man, it means your faith, your faith is dysfunctional. Fourthly, faith is a spiritual currency with which we buy stuff in the spirit. Do you hear me? Faith is a spiritual currency with which we go in and we buy stuff that we want to acquire. If you are having a US dollar bill in one hand and a one rand bill in the other hand, guess what? You'll acquire much more stuff with the US bill compared to the rand. Now the question is, how strong is your faith? Because the stronger your faith, the bigger your beginning power. Fifthly, faith is the bridge that links you to your desired outcome. You are where you are today. Faith, literally, it is the bridge that allows you to connect with what you want to achieve in life. We all know that bridges allow us to cross rivers, to cross valleys. In the same manner, faith allows you to cross your rivers. Faith allows you to cross your, your valleys. Faith will shortcut your distance that you have to travel to achieve certain things. Did somebody hear me this morning? Yeah. Faith will literally shortcut the amount of time that you need to achieve certain things. Could it be the reason why we're taking longer to see results in our lives is that we are lacking functional faith. You see, a faith-filled life is filled with possibilities. It abounds with possibilities. A faith-filled life knows no limits. This is the faith that Jesus refers to when he says in a couple of scriptures that I'll refer to right now, Mark 9 verse 23. Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you still like a child to be able to read this scripture and allow it to speak to you? Or you're saying, I've done it all. It's not working for me. That scripture doesn't apply to me. But Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. There's a type of faith that Jesus was talking about. In Matthew 21 verse 22, he says, if you believe, you receive whatever you ask for in prayer. There's a type of faith that Jesus is talking about. It is that faith that allows you to see results. Matthew 17 verse 19 to 20. This is a story when the disciples were not able to cast out a demon. A father had come to them and said, look here, my son is possessed. Can you please help the situation? They could not cast out the demon. Now they saw Jesus coming in and he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, help me. My son is being tormented. Now the word of God says here, they were not able to cast out the demon, but Jesus cast out the demon. And then after that moment, the disciples went in seclusion and they asked Jesus, now please explain to us, why were we not able to help this young man? Why were we not able to help? Then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus replied, you see, sometimes... You are asking questions. Why am I not seeing results in my life? I've been a believer for 15 years, but somewhere it looks like I've lost steam in my prayer life. It looks like prayers are no longer working. There is an answer here. Jesus answered them and he said to them, because you have so little faith. Because you have so little faith. I'm afraid to tell you today that maybe the reason why there are no results in our lives, we have so little faith. That's why things are not working out for us. And then he goes on to explain. He says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now let's pause there for a moment. Jesus says, your faith is little. Do you know that? But right after that he says, but if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, 
What Jesus was basically saying, your faith is smaller than a mustard seed, therefore it's not functional. Now you might wonder, what, what's the size of a mustard seed? A mustard seed, the diameter of the mustard seed is between one and two millimeters. One millimeter to two millimeters, which means you've got to put it right on your finger here to really see the size of that seed. Now for me it speaks about how potent faith is. Because Jesus says if it is as small as one millimeter in your life, you can do anything with that small size of faith. Now Jesus previously said your faith is so little. Which means, I don't know if there was faith. <laughs> but Jesus says, there is faith, but it's smaller than one millimeter. That's what Jesus is saying here. Because he says here, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this big mountain. Now I want you to look at this too. One millimeter in a mountain. If a mil one millimeter thing can move the mountain, give me that millimeter thing. I don't want that mountain. Many of us have been focusing on the mountains and we are carrying mountains and ignoring faith in the process. Yeah. You see, we need to have a paradigm shift where we're saying, I'm no longer looking at how big my problem is. I want to focus on how big my God is. Yes. Glory be to God. Yes. Now, our greatest challenge is to ensure that we are operating by faith and not by presumption. Could it be that what you've been operating with right now is not faith? It's actually presumption. Now you'll ask me, what does presumption mean? A good question, I'll answer you. Now you need to understand that being presumptuous is operating and moving forward with unwarranted confidence. It is when you have unwarranted confidence and misplaced assurance. You're moving forward thinking that I have all the armies behind me and therefore I can take on any, any battle. And then the battles come, you realize there's no army behind you. You're moving forward with assurance that you cannot count on. Let me give you a clear example. You are a married guy, a great husband. You have a wife who is so lovely, who is very generous, who is very kind. You have that understanding about your wife. And then one day after church, you go to your body and say, guys, come to my house. We'll have lunch today. <laughs> guys, come. We're going to have lunch today. We'll have grilled meat. We'll have all sorts of meats. Come. And then you rock up at your house with nine guys from church. <laughs> Boom, you go through the door. You say, honey, whatever you call your wife, I'm here. Um, what are we going to have for lunch? She's in the shower and she answers, Happy, you forgot that I've got a date with Pastor Trace. I'm actually on my way out. You know what you did? You had misplaced confidence, misplaced assurance. It's not that your wife is not kind. It's not that your wife is not giving, but it's because you're not assured of her availability. This is what we do with God. When God hasn't told you anything about your situation, you run on thinking he's backing you up. False assurance. Unwarranted confidence. This is our problem. That many believers are running without being assured of what they are running with. Now, if your faith is going to be yielding results, it has to have three components. Now, I'm going to the issue of faith. Now, I'm hoping that none of us have been running with presumption. If you have, let's shift tact. Let's now embrace what this thing, faith, is all about. Now for us to illustrate these three points, let's go to Romans chapter, eight, so Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Are we still together this morning? Because yes. we want results in our lives. Otherwise we will give up on our walk with the Lord. We shipwreck our faith in the process. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible says, Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Believing that he would become the father of many nations. Abraham believed that he would become a father of many nations. Why? For God has said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered. 
in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Now, the first component for your faith, if it is going to turn away from being presumptions to being faith, there has to be a word of God. There has to be a word of God which gives you and I something to stand on. You see, Abraham hoped against hope to believe that he would become a father of many nations. Why was he so confident in that? Why was he prepared to wait for so long? It's because God had told him so. It's because there was a word that God had given him. Because God said, that's how many descendants you will have. He stood on the spoken word. This morning, child of God, I want you to understand that as long as God has not told you about what you're believing, you have no right to believe in it. You have no right to believe it will come to pass. That sounds very harsh, but that is what I'm being told here. That outside the word of God is presumptions. That's right. If God hasn't told you, don't believe it. You see, many people are busy claiming stuff that God has not told them about. And therefore you're going to go to the grave still trusting God for it. Because you see, when God comes into your life, He's going to search for his word. He's not going to search for your opinions or your thinking abilities. But many times we've rationalized, if it makes sense, therefore it makes it possible. There are a lot of things that make sense, but they're not possible. The Bible says nothing was made which wasn't made by the word. Now who are we to believe that we'll make something without the word? Hallelujah. Our problem is we don't even open the Bible. Guess what? The day that we decide to open the word, you'll hear God speaking to you. Many of us don't open the Bible. We probably come and the only time that we get access to the word is when we read on the projector. <laughs> but today I want to challenge you, child of God. If you are to see results in your life, you've got to come to a place where the word becomes your closest ally. Because it is the word that will change, that will move heaven to come and move on your behalf. The Bible says, for he has exalted his word far above himself. Even during creation, he had to release a word for us to see what we see today. Isaiah 40 verse 7 the grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. Now many of us have more faith in what people say than in what God says. Now that is a problem. Because men die. Men change. They love you today. You are the hero today. Tomorrow you are a heroine. Tomorrow you are a villain rather. You don't know what has changed between yesterday and today fickleness you can't count on my words I'm not God that is why we have to go back to the word because his word is unchanging his word remains forever now the amount of word you carry in your heart determines your level of faith now let's not underestimate the distance between the head and the heart because the Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, when you know something, it's not just head knowledge. It is knowledge that comes out of revelation. It is when the word starts speaking to you, and the word reveals to you the mysteries of God, that that word can start working on your behalf. The reason why I'm saying that many of us, we come to church Sunday in, Sunday out. But when we go out and measure the results of our lives, they're different. But we've heard the same word. Could it be that for you and I, we are keeping the word in the head and God cannot work with the word that is in the head. The Lord will work with the word that has been revealed and is deposited in your heart. That is why we talk about the meditation of our hearts. We talk about when God was speaking to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, he says here, meditate on this law day and night and whatsoever you do, you shall prosper. His prosperity was determined by the meditations of his heart. You see, you can hear the word in the head, 
But the moment you engage by muttering and repeating the word, it starts speaking back to you. Then there's revelation. It is that revelation that produces faith that brings results in our lives. What is the second component of faith? Now it is a firm trust in God and God's word. Now when you look at the whole issue of Abraham, Abraham trusted fully in the spoken word. Verse 20, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. Now this is very important for us. There is no problem with the word of God. The problem is with the recipient of the word. The word is the same word that worked for Abraham, the same word that worked for Joseph. The same word that worked for Paul when he was preaching and Peter, all these apostles, it is the same word. Now, why is it that it's not res re having the same results in our lives? Now, the Bible says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. Do we come to a place where we waver in the promises of God? Now we have moved. It's no longer the issue of not knowing the word. It's no longer the issue of not having heard from God. You have heard from God. He was so clear when he spoke to you. But the question is, are you steadfast on the word? Do you fully trust and rely on God and say, I'm not going to move because I heard you speaking to me. Our issue is we quickly give up. We have option B and option C. But this morning I want to challenge you. Let the word of God remain as option A in our lives. Because then we can see our faith working on our behalf. The word of God can only work as in the same way that you work on it. You see, when you work on the word, you wait on the word. You meditate on the word. You write it on the walls. You speak to yourself concerning the word. You speak back to your heart on what God has said to you. That is what Paul was saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 8. He says, wage war in line with the word of prophecy that you received. He was challenging Timothy to engage with the word. This is my question to you today. How much pressure are you putting on the spoken word? How much demand are you placing on what God has said concerning your health? Because what the enemy will do, he'll come tell you, you're never going to get healed. This issue, you, you remember your uncle died from it? Your grandma died from it? What makes you think you're different? That's one word coming. But we have a sure word that you've been given by the Lord. He says, by his stripes, you are made whole. By his stripes, you are healed. I sent my word to you and my word healed you. This is what we should be holding on to. You see, when the word, word of God says, for the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, it's now talking about, when it says the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, it means there are many other swords out there that are going around. And these swords are meant to kill and destroy, but the word of God is sharper than all these other swords that can come into our lives. Do you realize that the greatest wound that, a, that you can be inflicted on is not a physical wound. It's a wound that comes through the word spoken over your life. We see broken lives right now because of words that were spoken when they were 10 years old. That's the power of the words. Thirdly, the word needs, the faith rather, needs an appropriate action that is based on the word. Appropriate action. Now, Abraham had a promise. He waited for the promise. He waited for 25 years. What made him wait for 25 years? What made him wait? He had appropriate action. We all know the issues that happened with Hagar and Ishmael, but he went back to the word. His action was appropriate. You see, we say we have faith for financial breakthrough. We have faith for income to come from unlikely sources. And yet when people come and ask us and say, Lena, how are things going? Like, hey, these days I'm broke. Man, these days I'm as poor as a church mouse. You see, you're undoing what you're believing God for. Now you need to have appropriate faith that is in line with what you're believing God for. When you're reading James 2 verse 14, James writes and says, Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? 
Some of us need to change the way we dress in line with we, where we believe God is taking us to. Do you hear me? You're going to dress up the, the part right now because you're preparing your environment for where God is taking you. You've got to change your lingo in line with where God is taking you. You've got to change your behavior in line with what you believe in God is doing in your life. So where are you at? Now briefly, with these few minutes coming, I want to share with you some of the marks of a faith-filled life. Some of the marks of a faith-filled life. This is not an exhaustive list, but it will give you an indicator of where you're at. Number one, faith-filled people have confidence in what God says, in the word of God. It is really as simple as that. The moment you start questioning what the word says is an indicator that your faith is dying. Yeah. A lot of people practice selective reading of scriptures, selective listening of scriptures. There are certain scriptures they will not allow to come into their ears because it's not in line with what they want to happen in their lives. Could that be an indicator that faith is dying? Hebrews 11 verse 3 says here, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Through faith we understand that all that we see was created by the word of God. You see, this means our knowledge on this subject cannot really justify where we stand. Our knowledge, our, our studies, it's an issue of believing that when God says it, I believe it. I can't explain to you how Mary conceived Jesus. But I know Jesus was conceived. That's all that matters to me. Hallelujah. Are we together this morning? I can't really explain to you how the Spirit of God made a woman pregnant. I can't explain to you. But I believe with all my heart that Jesus was conceived of the Spirit of God. And that settles it. If I try to rationalize it, I try to explain it scientifically, it falls dead. That is why we need faith to believe what the Word says. You see, it is a mark of faith when you're comfortable with what makes you uncomfortable in the word. That's what it is. When you're comfortable with standing and saying, guys, this is what the word says. And I believe it. And I'll proclaim it on top of the mountain. As long as I have breath in this body, I'll speak the truth and nothing else. That's a mark of faith. Faith agrees with the word. Point number two. Faith-filled people give uncommon offerings. Yes? We're going to go there. Faith-filled people give uncommon gifts. Right. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says here, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable offering than Cain. There is stuff that was attached to the giving of Abel that was missing in the giving of Cain. This morning, can you look into your life and say, I'm a faith-filled person because my giving is uncommon. What makes a giving uncommon? I can highlight to you a few things. You see, when your giving is uncommon and it is driven by faith, it means that your giving is characterized by expecting returns. Many times we have wasted seed because we're not expecting a return. Some people think, man, I don't think that is really biblical. But the Bible tells me, give and it shall be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour where into your bosom. So when I give, I'm giving expecting a return. I might not expect financial returns, but I'm looking forward for the Lord to give back. It could be protection over my house. People will be hit left, right, center in my neighborhood, but I won't be touched. It's not because I have the high-tech security. No, it's because there is a God who knows how to give back. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, how many times have you had kids getting involved in accidents coming from school? Stuff happens. But all you do, you pray for your kids and you let them go. The father who knows how to give back looks after your kids. So when you give, have an expectation in your heart 
not just for financial returns, but really for a holistic giving back that comes from God. Glory be to God. Faith-filled giving is characterized by being purposeful in your giving. How purposeful are you? You see, we are purposeful with what we want to acquire for our homes. We write down, we want to acquire a new table, we want to acquire a new patio furniture, we want to acquire a new swimming pool net. You, you're so purposeful with all these things, but are you purposeful with your giving? That's an indicator of a faith-filled giving and an uncommon offering. It means you say to yourself, Father, this season, we've got this amount of money we've set aside for giving. Whom shall we give? That's right. You see, when the Lord starts speaking to you that way, he will tell you where it is fertile to give. Some have been giving in arid places because there's no return in that specific area because the blessing of God is not there. But when the Lord starts directing your giving, it's no longer a common giving, child of God. It is giving that yields more than you expect or think. I'm going to leave that faith giving portion. Let's move on to the next uh, mark of faith filled people. Faith filled people attract divine activities in their lives. You see, when a life is filled up by faith, there has to be God kind of activities in your life. Glory be to God. Because when you are walking by faith, you please God. When you please God, you attract God. When you attract God, you attract the God kind of activities in your life. Do you see the progression here? Walk by faith, you are pleasing God. When you please God, God feels like I can abide here. This place is comfortable. I want to go down and fellowship with him. I will share with him my secrets. That's a faith-filled life. There's a story of Enoch in the Bible where the Bible says by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Can you imagine a community? One day brother X disappears, gone. Like hey what happened? Police look, up, look for him, they could not even find him. Not knowing God raptured him. Amen. This is what happened. I would imagine his community were looking for Enoch. Like, guys, Enoch, Enoch, where are you? They looked for him under the rocks, under the trees. They could not find Enoch. But I would imagine at some point they actually realized this man walked with God. He might have gone to his friend. You see, when you walk with God, with faith, you attract God kind of activities. And when you attract divine activities in your lives, it directs people to who God is. You see, when people see stuff happening in your life, they'll come and ask you, tell us about this. How do you do this? If we are faithful to our calling, we then draw glory to God. We are able to tell them that it's not about me. There is a father who is backing up all this stuff. Point number four, faith-filled people Believe in the self-existing God and his ability to reward them. You know, you go through life and life knocks you. You've been knocked down so many times to a point where you have lifted your hands and said, God, if you were there, why did my mom die? Where were you when my son was sick? Where were you when my marriage was breaking down? You're doubting the self-existence of God. I don't know if you've been there before where you have questioned the existence of God. Many people have shipwrecked their faith by questioning the existence of God. Where were you when I was asking for wisdom? Where were you when I was writing my exam? You told me you will never leave me nor forsake me. You question the existence of God. Could it be a sign that your faith is really being shaken? Or it's malfunctioning? Some of us have moved away from doubting the existence of God. You really believe that he's a good God, he's existing God, but you doubt his ability to reward you. You say, he's, he's good for other people. He rewards other people. But for me, I'm just plodding along. 
I'm just doing, I'm just doing the routine. You believe he's there, but you don't trust him to reward you. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that seek him diligently. This is very key. It's an indicator of your faith levels where you look at your life and say things are not working out, but you know what? My time is coming. I believe he will reward me. He will remember me. That's when you go to Hebrews 6 verse 10 that says he does not forget the ministry that you do, even that which you continue doing. He doesn't forget. Do you realize that some of the blessings you're experiencing right now are not as a result of what you've done yesterday? It's a result of what you did in varsity. The good you did then, God remembers, but you've forgotten. Glory be to God. So we need to come to a place where we believe that he's a self-existing God and that he rewards me. Point number five. Faith-filled people operate with a senseless obedience to God. (laughs) Did you hear me? Faith-filled people operate with a senseless obedience to God. It's without sense. That's what I'm trying to say. The Bible talks about how Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. People of God, it's one thing to be called by God to go to Diara Congo and be a missionary there. It's tough. It's difficult. You're not aware of their culture. But it's another thing for the Lord to say, Mpo, get onto the flight, buy a ticket to the, to, to the Arab countries. And you say, Lord, where, where, Iran, where, where do you want me to go? Say, just take a ticket, get off in the first drop-off zone, whatever that means. You don't even know where God is calling you to go, but you rise up and you go. How many times has the Lord asked us to do things that don't make sense? A faith-filled life will obey. Abraham obeyed and he left his mother and father, his country. He was a wealthy man. He could take whatever he took. He went with it and he left. He, I believe Abraham was saying, I would rather make mistakes in trying to obey God. Rather, let's be in that position. Let's have that demeanor in our lives that says, you know, this is, I'm getting this sense that this is what God is saying. I'm not quite sure how this thing is, but I'm going to go with that because I'd rather make mistakes but trying to obey God. Glory be to God. The last point, faith-filled people stay the course. Faith-filled people stay the course. The Bible says here, by faith, Hebrews 11 verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise. Don't you think at some point Abraham was tempted to go back? When things were hard in Canaan, when things were difficult, no friends, people were denying him. But the Bible says he stayed the cause. He remained in that promised land. Are you prepared to stay the course when God has spoken to you? You see, life is not a hundred meter dash. It is a marathon. And there's something called the loneliness of long distance runners. There is a loneliness that comes with long distance runners. You can speak to Musa and I who have done the, the comrades. 89 kilometers is a long, long way to go. And I tell you in the process, the temptation is high to bail out. The temptation is high to give up. But the question is, does your faith allow you to go all the way until the promise becomes a reality? You see, this morning I want you to understand something. That God is not really interested in results in your life. Because he knows he'll, get, he'll give you that stuff. But he's interested in relationship. So he will allow you to go through stuff that will build up a closer relationship with him. For example, I've come to realize that couples become very close in times of adversity if they manage the adversity properly. They get so united. 
They get closer to each other. They become so intimate because they're saying, Wifey, it's just you and me. We're going to have to stick it out. We're going to have to go through this. They become very close to each other in moments of adversity. And when God allows adversity to come into your life, he's really saying, I want to get closer to you. So he's more interested in relationship than results. You see, we need to come to a point now in our walk with God where we stop just feeling scriptures, but we start thinking scriptures. What do I mean by that? We start meditating. You see, when you read Psalms 37, it says, the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. You see, it doesn't qualify to say he, you are ordered in good things only. You see, there are times where God will order you into trouble. Bad things happen to good people. The Bible says Job was a God-fearing man. Job was a righteous man in his days. And yet, without him being involved in the conversation, he was implicated in some stuff. Job lost his wife, lost his kids, lost all his properties. He lost his wife in the sense that the wife was like, dude, forget about God. The wife was still there, but the wife was not really there because she wasn't giving the moral support that Job needed. The wife was saying, curse your God and die. What kind of a wife does that? But she was vulnerable. What am I trying to say today? Whatever you're going through, don't lose sight of your purpose. You see, many times the devil will cause us to focus on the process and will lose sight of the purpose. You see, if Jesus had paid attention to what he was going through, he would have given up. But the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he ignored the shame of the cross. So he ignored the process and focused on the purpose. May the Lord help us, really, to come to a place where we say, let the process happen. I'm convinced that I'm getting there. I'm convinced that this ministry will grow. I'm convinced that I'll become what God has called me to be. You see, I might be where I don't want to be, but I'm not staying here. This is not my destination. I'm just going through this. That's right. These are faith-filled people who are able to rightly divide seasons in their lives. Glory be to God. Yes. Question, what's the level of your faith now? Having heard what I've shared with you today, when you dip that faith meter in your heart, can you say that I have gone the long course? I have waited. I'm going to keep on waiting. The Bible says those who wait upon the Lord, they shall run with God without getting weary. They'll mount up on wings like an eagle. That is what faith people do. They look at their situation and they say, this is meant for my good. When Jesus departed, the disciples thought, man, this man is mean. How does he just leave us? You come in and you just go like that. And then Jesus said to them, it is for your good that I go to the Father. Because when I go to the Father, I'm going to ask him to bring the Spirit. He says, as long as I'm here, I can only be around you. Around you. I cannot be inside you. I'm interested in being inside of you. Therefore, it is good for you that I go to the Father. Because when I go to the Father, when I come by the Spirit, I'll get inside of you. The relationship gets deeper. But they didn't understand at that point. They were troubled in their hearts. And I believe they were questioning the sanity of what Jesus was doing. But he says, let it be so. It is for your good. It is for your good. They had to focus on the end result. Glory be to God. Shall we stand on our feet?